I'd like to welcome everybody to Check Your Show. This is season two. We're reading Catcher in the Rye. My name's Aaron. Some of y'all might know me by gimme, but some of y'all might not know me at all. But I think it's really important that we know these books really intimately. So I'm going to have to ask you to go check your shelf. Yes, sir. <laughs> your boy back at it again. What's up, all y'all beautiful young people? And you beautiful young pimple? You know what I'm saying? We really out here, man. Adults with acne. It's a whole dilemma. It's a whole disorder. It might be an endemic. But we back again. Back at it like always. Another episode of Check Your Shelf. We in season two right now. And in season two, we're reading Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. God, man, what a good book so far. We got three chapters in last episode, and we uh, we experienced a couple things. We experienced a, a $75 giveaway that I'm doing, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. We experienced meeting Holden Caulfield and learning that he's in some sort of institution, school, you know, program, but he's since left the story, this school that he's telling the story about, and we're learning he's telling his own story. Uh, we learned that his brother DB is an author in Hollywood, and this might be a reason for uh, Holden's disdain for the phonies that live in Hollywood. Um, we met Ack, uh, Robert Ackley, <clears throat> Holden's dorm neighbor, Ackley kid, Holden's dorm, Holden's dorm neighbor. He was a crass, brash, rude son of a bitch. Um, we learned about the, uh, well, we got to experience the infamous red hat that he got from New York for only a dollar. That red, black lum- that red and black lumberjack, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, we also got to meet Holden's roommate, Ward Stradlater, who was a, a conceited son of a bitch, but very generous and kind. Um, and then finally, we got to experience... Uh, Stradlater's entrance, which included taking off his shirt, mentioning that he left his date in the annex, and trying to get Holden out of his nice jacket, even though he was already packed up and ready to go. So, we left on a pretty interesting note where he was showing open disdain for Ackley, but um, was really into the idea of Stradlater's ways of life, um, which was interesting to me because they both seemed kind of phony, so... <clears throat> we learned that um, we learned that maybe Holden's viewpoints and um, radar might be off a little bit. But what do I know? I'm just reading it. That's for that seventy-five dollars. I know that piqued your ear a little bit. Yeah, I'm giving seventy-five dollars cash, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo. Well, I don't really do Venmo, so it's gonna have to be Cash App or PayPal, honestly. But or cash, or any kind of gift cards, you know what I'm saying, if y'all want Amazon, or iTunes, Xbox, Theme, whatever, I don't, I don't care, man, but $50 for first place, $25 for second place, at the end of every episode, you can hop in the Facebook chat, uh, the Facebook group, or you can hop in the Discord channel, uh, both of those, you'll have an opportunity to answer the questions, and, uh, you know, whoever has the most right at the end of the season, Gonna get 50 bucks and then second place gonna get 25. So pay attention, read along. You might be able to get a full tank of gas out this whole thing. But we're at the top of chapter four. See? Wow, gray highlight, that's whack. It should have been blue. Whoa. I wanna make it a little bit bigger. Seems like. Could be the perfect size. <clears throat> now, where's the rolly book? I can't see because my switch is in the way. It kind of bugs me. Ah! Ah! Watch out! Watch out! Watch out! Watch out! You gotta be good with that. You, uh, flick him! Watch out! Flick him! Sorry if you're just listening. I fucking was just trying to make it so the PDF file was perfectly centered, and that was funny if you were watching the YouTube, so go follow me on YouTube, or you missed, you'll just miss it forever, huh, joke's on you, 
Chapter 4 I didn't have anything special to do, so I went down to the can and chewed the rag with him. Stride later, I believe, is who we're talking about. But I chewed the rag with him while he was shaving. And we were the only ones in the can because everybody was still down at the game. It was hot as hell and the windows were all steamy. There were about ten wash bowls, all against the wall. Stride later had the middle one. I sat down on the one right next to him and started turning the cold water on and off. This nervous habit I have. Stride later kept whistling Song of India while he shaved. He had one of those very piercing whistles that are practically never in tune. And he always picked out some song that's hard to whistle, even if you're a good whistler like Song of India or Slaughter on 10th Avenue. He could really mess a song up. You remember, as I said before, that Ackley was a slob in his personal habits? Well, so was Stradlater, but in a different way. Stradlater was more of a secret slob. He always looked alright, Stradlater, but for instance, you should have seen the razor he shaved himself with. It was always rusty as hell and full of lather and hairs and crap. He never cleaned it or anything. He always looked good when he was finished fixing himself up, but he was a secret slob anyway, if you knew him the way I did. The reason he fixed himself up to look good was because he was madly in love with himself. He thought he was the handsomest guy in the Western Hemisphere. He was pretty handsome too, I'll admit it. You know, it's funny, that's the second time we've heard him say, I'll admit it, when he's talking about Stradlater. See, right up here at the end of chapter 3 is the last thing we read. But he mentions his build. I have to admit it. And then later down here he says, where is it? <clears throat> uh, he was handsome too, I'll admit it. It's just interesting that he feels the need to... It's either poor writing or it's intentional. So like he's... Feels the need that he has to... Confess something. But he was mostly the kind of handsome guy that if your parents saw his picture in your yearbook, they right away say, who's this boy? I mean, he was mostly a yearbook kind of handsome guy. I knew a lot of guys at Pensy that were a lot handsomer than Stradlater, but they wouldn't look handsome if you saw their pictures in the yearbook. They'd look like they had big noses or their ears stuck out. I've had that experience frequently. Anyway, I was sitting on the washbowl next to where Stradlater was shaving, sort of turning the water on and off. And I still had my red hunting hat on with the, with the peak around to the back and all. I really got a bang out of that hat. Hey, Stradlater said, want to do me a big favor? What? I said, not too enthusiastic. He was always asking you to do him a big favor. You take a very handsome guy or a guy that thinks he's a real hot shot and they're always asking you to do them a big... They're always, oh, come here, ribbity, ribbity. Uh, uh. You always take a, you take a very handsome guy or a guy that thinks he's a real hot shot and they're always asking you to do them a big favor just because they're crazy about themselves. They think you're crazy about them too and that you're just dying to do them a favor. It's sort of funny in a way. You going out tonight? He said. I might. I might not. I don't know. Why? I got about a hundred pages to read for history Monday, he said. How's about writing a composition for me for English? I'll be up the creek if I don't get the goddamn thing in my hand by Monday the reason I ask. How about it? I'll be up. I guess he's like, I'll be up shit. Shit's creek. I'll be up the creek if I don't get the goddamn thing in my hand by Monday. The reason I ask. How about it? It was very ironical. That's the second time he's used ironical. Oh, I gotta get the phony counter up. He hasn't said it yet, but... He hasn't said it yet, but... It was very ironical, it really was. I'm the one that's flunking out of the goddamn place, and you're asking me to write you a goddamn composition? I said. Yeah, I know. The thing is, though, I'll be up the creek if I don't get it in. Be a buddy. Be a buddy Roo, okay? I didn't answer him right away. Suspense is good for some bastards like Stradlater. What on? I said. Anything. Anything descriptive. A room or a house. Or something you once lived in or something, you know, just as long as it's descriptive as hell. He gave out a big yawn while he said that. Which is something that gives me a royal pain in the ass. I mean, if somebody yawns right while they're asking you to do them a goddamn favor. Just don't do it too good is all. He said. That son of a bitch Hartzell thinks you're a hot shot in English. 
and he knows you're my roommate, so I mean, don't stick all the commas and stuff in the right place. That's something else that gives me a royal pain. I mean, to be honest, he has, I think he kind of has a, he's got a right to be fucking pretty mad about that. You better be asking for money, bro. I mean, if a Ferrari, or what was it, if a Jaguar is like only $4,000, you better ask for like $1.50. fifty. I'm not sure if I like Stride later or not yet. I don't think I do. That's something else that gives me a royal pain. I mean, if you're good at writing compositions, and somebody starts talking about commas, Stride later was always doing that. He wanted you to think that the only reason he was lousy at writing compositions was because he stuck all the commas in the wrong place. He was a little bit like Ackley that way. I once sat next to Ackley at the basketball game. We had a terrific guy on the team, Howie Coyle, that could sink them from the middle of the floor without even touching the backboard or anything. Bullin! Ackley kept saying the whole goddamn game that Coyle had the perfect build for basketball. God, how I hate that stuff. I got bored sitting on that wash bowl after a while, so I backed up a few feet and started doing this tap dance, just for the hell of it. I was just amusing myself. I can't really tap dance or anything, but it was just a stone floor in the can and it was good for tap dancing. I started imitating one of those guys in the movies. In one of those musicals. I hate the movies like Poison, but I get a bang out of imitating them. Old Stradlater watched me in the mirror while he was shaving. All I need is an audience. I'm an exhibitionist. I'm the goddamn governor's son, I said. I was knocking myself out, tap dancing all over the place. He doesn't want me to be a tap dancer. He wants me to go to Oxford, but it's in my goddamn blood tap dancing. Old Stradlater laughed. He didn't have too bad a sense of humor. It's the opening night of the Zigfield Follies. Oh, I guess he's still in character. It's the opening night of the Zigfield Follies. <laughs> I was getting out of breath. I have hardly any wind at all. The leading man can't go on. He's drunk as a bastard. Who do they get to take his place? Me. That's who. Little old goddamn governor's son. Where'd you get that hat? Brad later said. He meant my hunting hat. He'd never seen it before. I was out of breath anyway. So I quit horsing around. I took off my hat and looked at it for about the 19th time. 90th time. Tried to slip a sneaky little N in there. I got it in New York this morning for a buck. You like it? Stride later nodded. Sharp, he said. He was only flattering me, though, because right away he said, Listen, are you going to write that composition for me? I have to know. If I get the time, I will. If I don't, I won't. I said, The f- <laughs> <coughs> I just inhaled some spit and almost died. I was about to say, um, that's like a really, that's a really fire answer. I think, uh, I think, I think if I was... I think I would have given him a similar answer. If I was in a situation like that, I'd like to think I would anyway. I went over and sat down at the wash bowl next to him again. Who's your date? I asked him. Fitzgerald? Hell no. I told you, I'm through with that pig. Yeah? Don't give her to me, boy. No kidding, she's my type. Take her. She's too old for you. All of a sudden, for no good reason, really, except that I was sort of in the mood for horsing around, I felt like jumping off the wash bowl and getting old Stradlater and a half Nelson. A wrestling hold, in case you didn't know, where you get the other guy around the neck and choke him to death if you feel like it. So I did it, landing on him like a goddamn panther. Hey, gut it out, hold him for Christ's sake, Stradlater said. He didn't feel like horsing around, he was shaving and all. What do you want to make me do, cut my goddamn head off? I didn't let go, though. I had a pretty good half Nelson on him. Liberate yourself from my vice-like grip, I said. Jesus Christ. He put down his razor and all of a sudden jerked his arms up and sort of broke my hold on him. He was a very strong guy. I'm a very weak guy. Now cut the crap, he said. He started shaving himself all over again. He shaved himself twice to look gorgeous with his crummy old razor. Who is your date if it isn't Fitzgerald? I asked him. I sat down on the wash bowl next to him again. 
that Phyllis Smith, babe? No, it was supposed to be, but the arrangements got all screwed up. I got Bud Thaw's girl's roommate now. Hey, I almost forgot. She knows you. Who does? My date. Yeah? I said, what's her name? I was pretty interested. I'm thinking, uh, Jean Gallagher. Boy, I nearly dropped dead when he said that. Jane Gallagher, I said. I even got it from the washbowl when he said that. I damn near dropped dead. I mean, again, I have, I can't, I can't help but ca call into question the dude's writing abilities. I don't, I, 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 I have to give him the benefit of the doubt and hope that he's doing this intentionally because this is, this is Holden telling us the story. Like Holden is the narrator, right? So I'm imagining Holden saying everything, even even the words like Strad later said. So, I nearly dropped dead when he said that. I damn near dropped dead. He's either trying to imply that Holden doesn't have a great vocabulary, which we've already been told about, or he's not a great writer. Those are the only two options. And I mean, this book survived the, I don't know, the 50s were weird, I guess. You're damn right I know her. She practically lived right next door to me. The summer before last, anyway. She had this big damn Doberman pincher. That's how I met her. Her dog used to keep coming over. You right in my light, Holden, for Christ's sake. You have to stand right there. Boy, was I excited, though. I really was. Where is she? I asked him. I ought to go down and say hello to her or something. Where is she? In the annex? Yeah. How'd she happen to mention me? Does she go to BM now? She said she might go there. She said she might go to Shipley too. I thought she went to Shipley. How she happened to mention me? I was pretty excited. I really was. I don't know for Christ's sake. Lift up, will you? You're on my towel. Stride later said I was sitting on his stupid towel. Jane Gallagher. I said I couldn't get over it. Jesus H. Christ. Old Stride later was putting Vita Vitalis. Vitalis. Old Stroudlater was putting Vitalis on his hair. My Vitalis. She's a dancer, I said. Ballet and all. She used to practice about two hours every day. Right in the middle of the hottest weather and everything. She was worried that it might make her legs lousy, all thick and all. I used to play checkers with her all the time. You used to play what with her all the time? Checkers. Checkers, for Christ's sake. Yeah, she wouldn't move any of her kings. What'd she do when she'd get a king? She wouldn't move it. She'd just leave it in the back row. She'd get them all lined up in the back row, then she'd never use them. She just liked the way they looked when they were all in the back row. Stradlater didn't say anything. That kind of stuff doesn't interest most people. Her mother belonged to the same club we did. I said, I used to caddy once in a while, just to make some dough. I caddied for her mother a couple times, she went around in a, she went, she went around in about 170 for nine holes. It's a golf term, I guess. 170 strokes. There's no way that's right. Is that how many strokes it takes in a nine? There's no way. That seems like a lot. Isn't it like, isn't it like three swing, like par five at the most? I don't understand how that works. I wonder if they mean, oh yeah, just to make some dough. No, he used to. I'm okay. Maybe I'm dumb. But now I'm thinking that's how much she paid him to caddy. Anyway. Stradlater wasn't hardly listening. He was combing his gorgeous locks. I ought to go down and at least say hello to her. Why don't you? I will in a minute. He started parting his hair all over again. It took him about an hour to comb his hair. Her mother and father were divorced. Her mother was married again to some booze hound. Skinny guy with hairy legs. I remember him. He wore shorts all the time. Jane said he was supposed to be a playwright or some goddamn thing, but all I ever saw him do was booze all the time and listen to every single goddamn mystery program on the radio. And run around the goddamn house naked, with Jane around and all. Yeah? Dry later said. That really interested him about the booze hound running around the house naked with Jane around. 
Stratlator was a very sexy bastard. Alright. Alright. That's... <laughs> I'm gonna put that in the... I'm gonna put that in the Facebook group. That's gonna be a fun little, uh... Out of context <laughs> paragraph to read. Especially if you, I guess you might need to know the context, but that's funny to me. I'm gonna post it anyway. She had a lousy childhood. I'm not kidding. That didn't interest Stride later though. Only very sexy stuff interested him. Jane Gallagher. Jesus. Couldn't get her off my mind. I really couldn't. I gotta go down and say hello to her at least. God, he said that like four times in a row, huh? Not in a row, but. Why the hell don't you instead of keep saying it? Yeah, get him, Stradlator. Fuck him up. Pussy. I walked over to the window, but. I walked over to the window, but. You couldn't see out of it. It was so steamy from all the heat in the can. I'm not in the mood right now, I said. I wasn't either. You have to be in the mood for those things. I thought she went to Shipley. I could have sworn she went to Shipley. I walked around the can for a little while. I didn't have anything else to do. Did she enjoy the game? I said. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. Did she tell you we used to play checkers all the time or anything? I don't know, for Christ's sake. I only just met her. Darlater said. He was finished combing his goddamn gorgeous hair. He's putting away all his crummy toilet articles. Toilet articles, huh? I like that. I love, I do like how we're seeing, like, really how neurotic he is. Like, I'm not in the mood right now. I thought she went to Shipley. I swear she went to Shipley's. Did she mention that we played checkers? Like, the poor, oh, the poor kid, man. I would equate that to modern day, like, I would equate that to, like, modern day texting a chick 35 times or, um, Facebook messaging somebody over and over or commenting hearts all the time or poking without them poke I don't know. I don't even know if poking's a thing anymore. That might have just dated me and made me seem really old, but my legs itch like crazy. Listen, give him my regards, will you? Okay, Stradlater said, but I knew he probably wouldn't. You take a guy like Stradlater, they never give your regards to people. He went back to the room, but I snuck around in the can for a while, thinking about old Jane. Then I went back to the room, too. Stridelator was putting on his tie in front of the mirror when I got there. He spent around half his goddamn life in front of the mirror. I sat down in my chair and sort of watched him for a while. Hey, don't, don't tell her I got kicked out, will ya? Okay. That was one good thing about Stridelator. You didn't have to explain every goddamn little thing with him the way you had to with Ackley. Mostly, I guess, because he wasn't too interested. That's really why Ackley, that's really why Ack, with Ackley it was different. Ackley was a very nosy bastard. <clears throat> he put on my houndstooth jacket. Without permission. He never told him he could wear it up. I don't think he could wear it. I know, I don't, that never, that conversation never happened. Jesus, now try not to stretch it all over the place. I said, I'd only worn it about twice. I won't. Where the hell's my cigarettes? On the desk. He never knew where he left anything. Under a muffler. He put them under my coat pocket. My coat pocket. He put them in his coat pocket. My coat pocket. I kind of like read ahead and my brain just blended both of them together. I pulled the peak of my hunting hat. I pulled the peak of- ah, Come on, ribbity baby! I pulled the peak of my hunting hat around to the front all of a sudden for a change. I was getting sort of nervous all of a sudden. I'm quite a nervous guy. Listen, where are you going on your date with her? I asked him. You know yet? I don't know. New York, if we have time. She only signed out for 9.30, for Christ's sake. I don't like the way he said it. So I said, the reason she did that, she probably just didn't know what a handsome, charming bastard you are. If she'd known, she probably would have signed out for 9.30 in the morning. Goddamn right, Stradlater said. You couldn't, ri you couldn't rile him too easily. He was too conceited. No kidding now. Do that composition for me. He said he had his coat on and he was all ready to go. Don't knock yourself out or anything, but just make it descriptive as hell, okay? I didn't answer him. I didn't feel like it. All I said was... 
Ask her if she still keeps all her kings on the back row. Okay. Stride later said, but I knew he wouldn't. Take it easy now. He banged the hell out of the room. I sat there for about a half hour after he left. I mean, I just sat in my chair, not doing anything. I kept thinking about Jane. And about Stradlater having a date with her and all. It made me so nervous I nearly went crazy. I already told you what a sexy bastard Stradlater was. All of a sudden, Ackley barged back in. Through the damn shower curtains as usual. For once in my stupid life, I was really glad to see him. He took my mind off the other stuff. He stuck around until dinner time, talking about all the guys at Pensy that he had hated their guts and squeezing this big pimple on his chin. Yeah, relatable. He didn't even use his handkerchief. I don't even think the bastard ha- had a handkerchief, if you want to know the truth. I never saw him use one anyway. Ending on a nice little subtle... Like, he ends he ends the, the chapters really smoothly, and I like that. So, I was under the impression that Stradlater's date, Stradlater's date's roommate asked about her. Not Stradlater's date. I thought it was Stradlater's date's roommate, so I gotta find that. Who's your date? Fitzgerald. So, Holden wanted to get with Fitzgerald. Who's your date if it's not Fitzgerald, Phyllis Smith, and no, it's supposed to be. I got Bud Thaw's. Oh, okay, so Stradlater's buddies, Bud Thaw. Bud Thaw has a girlfriend. Bud Thaw's girlfriend has a roommate. That roommate is Jane Gallagher. Okay. Yep. I was wrong. I was wrong again. Chapter 5 We always had the same meal on Saturday nights at Pensy. It was supposed to be a big deal because they give you steak. I'll bet a thousand bucks the reason they did that was because a lot of guys' parents came up to the school on Sunday. And old Thurmer probably figured everybody's mother would ask why their darling boy... Oh wait, sorry. Old Thurmer, that's the headmaster. And old Thurmer probably figured... Everybody's mother would ask their darling boy what he had for dinner last night, and he'd say steak. What a racket. You should have seen the steaks. There were these little hard, dry jobs that you could hardly even cut. You always got these very lumpy mashed potatoes on steak night, and for dessert you got brown Betty, which nobody ate. Brown Betty, that seems like a good goog. Let's see what the fuck another 50s vocab means. Bring up the Googs page. Hopefully there's no pornographical material on my homepage. No, I'm just kidding. There never is. Alright. Is that showing up? Sure is. Googs as hell, bro. We're an efficient streamer. Look at me go. Look at me go. Brown Betty dessert because that definitely seems like a porn title. Brown Betty milk honey apple cider. Let's see what's up. Brown Betty, dessert or racial epithet? Jesus. I didn't expect to get into fucking politics reading about a dessert, lady. Race based? Now I kind of feel like I want to. Ah, the B is not capitalized, but the B in, Be- the B in Brown is not capitalized, but the B in Betty is. Ooh. <laughs> getting dirty. Getting risky. <clears throat> Excuse me. Stale cake crumbs, dark brown sugar, cup sugar, some sugar, cinnamon, allspice, ginger, cloves. There we go. Apples, lemon juice, apple cider, four teaspoons of butter. So yeah, you're just gonna fucking fuck up the. Okay, yeah, okay. That's okay. That's pretty good. That's probably pretty good. Fuck with that. Um, that sounds pretty good. Would be really good in the winter time.
Brown Betty was nobody ate except maybe the little kids in the lower school that didn't know any better. And guys like Ackley that ate everything. It was nice though. When we got out of the dining room, there was about three inches of snow on the ground and it was still coming down like a madman. It looked pretty as hell and we all started throwing snowballs and horsing around all over the place. It was very childish, but everybody was enjoying themselves. I didn't have a date or anything, so I and this friend of mine, Mal, Mal Brassard, that was on the wrestling team, I decided, ugh, so many commas, this kid. I didn't have a date or anything, so I and this friend of mine, Mal Brassard, that was on the wrestling team, decided we would take a bus into Agerstown and have a hamburger and maybe see a lousy movie. Neither of us felt like sitting around on our ass all night. I asked Maul if he would. I asked Maul if he. Bleh, I asked Maul if he minded. Maul if he minded. Seemed to fuck my tongue up a little bit. I asked Maul if he minded if Ackley came along with us. The reason I asked was because Ackley never did anything on Saturday night except stay in his room and squeeze his pimples or something. Why are we bringing up pimples twice when I have a big pimple on my lip, man? I'm really self conscious. JD Salinger's. He's spying on me, bro. This, this is fucked up. Maul said he didn't mind, but that he wasn't too crazy about the idea. He didn't like Ackley much. Anyway, we both went to our rooms to, to get ready and all, and while I was putting on my galoshes and crap, I yelled over and asked old Ackley if he wanted to go to the movies. He could hear me all right through the shower curtains, but he didn't answer me right away. He, he was the kind of guy that hates to answer you right away. He finally came over through the goddamn curtains and stood on the shower ledge and asked who was going besides me. He always had to know who was going. I swear, if that guy was shipwrecked somewhere and you rescued him in a goddamn boat, he would just want to know who the guy was that rowing it. That He would want to know who the guy was that was rowing it before he'd even get in. I told him Maul Brassard was going. He said, that bastard. All right. Wait a second. You'd think he was doing you a big favor. Let me try that again then. He said, That bastard. Ugh. All right, wait a second. You'd think he was doing you a big favor. It took him about five hours to get ready. While he was doing it, I went over to my window, opened it, and packed a snowball with my bare hands. The snow was very good for packing. I didn't throw it at anything though. I started to throw it at a car that was parked across the street, but I changed my mind. The car looked so nice and white. Then I started to throw it at a hydrant, but that looked too nice and white too. Finally, I didn't throw it at anything. All I did was close the window and walk around the room with the snowball, packing it harder. A little while later, I still had it with me when I and Bross Nod, <laughs> is that another type of? Isn't it, Bra isn't it Brassnard or Bossnard? Where does it now? I gotta go back. Brassard, that's what it is. Brassnad! Good old Brassnads over here. A little while later, I still had it with me when I and Brassard and Ackley got on the bus. The bus driver opened the doors and made me throw it out. I told him I wasn't gonna chuck it at anybody, but he wouldn't believe me. People never believe you. Brassard and Ackley both had seen the picture that was playing, so so all we did was we had a couple of hamburgers and played the pinball machine for a little while and took the bus back to Pensy. I didn't care about not seeing the movie anyway. It was supposed to be a comedy with Cary Grant in it and all that crap. Besides, I'd been to the movies with Brassard and Ackley before. They both laughed like hyenas at stuff that wasn't even funny. I didn't even enjoy sitting next to them in the movies. It seems like he's doing that thing, like, where you hit on a girl and she's not interested, so you call her an ugly, you so, so like, you're ugly anyway. That's what that, that's the kind of energy I'm getting off Strat later right now, or, um, off of Holden right now. I'm glad we didn't go to the movies, honestly. I didn't even want to see that movie, and I don't even really like those guys anyway. Like, ugh, gosh, you know? <laughs> that's how I feel about the kid right now. It was only about a quarter to nine when we got back to the dorm. Old Broussard was a old Broussard was a bridge friend, bridge fiend. 
Oh, the game. I was thinking of an actual, like, stone bridge. Old Broussard was a bridge fiend, and he started looking around the dorm for a game. Old Ackley parked himself in my room just for a change. Only, instead of sitting on the arm of Stradlater's chair, he laid down on my bed, with his face right on my pillow and all. He started talking in this very monotonous voice and picking at all his pimples. I swear to God, he said pimple more than he said phony almost. Jesus. I dropped about a thousand hints, but I couldn't get rid of him. All he did was keep talking in this very monotonous voice about some babe he was supposed to have had sexual intercourse with over the summer. He'd already told me about it about a hundred times. Every time he told it, it was different. One minute, he'd be giving it to her in his cousin's Buick. The next minute, he'd be giving it to her under some boardwalk. It was all a lot of crap. Naturally, he was a virgin if I ever saw one. I doubt he ever even gave anybody a feel. Oh man, a fucking housefly just flew into my room right on my ring light. That's gonna be so distracting. Why is it every time I record a podcast, there's a bug in my room? I gotta stop leaving the door open for my cat. My cat be going outside because she's adventurous and a hunter and a killer. Now I gotta fly in my room, you know? Let your animal be free and deal with bugs or nah, you know? Crazy. The choices we make. Where are we at? He was a virgin if I ever saw one. I doubt if he ever I doubt if he ever even gave anybody a feel. Anyway. Finally, I had come to write out and tell him that I had to write a composition for Strad later and that he had to clear the hell out so I could concentrate. He finally did, but he took his time about it as usual. After he left, I put my pajamas and bathrobe and my old hunting hat and started writing the composition. I put on my pajamas. I think I skipped a word. I think I, was, I, I, think I assumed he was going to pack it away or some shit, but he put on his pajamas, bathrobe, hunting hat and started writing the composition. The thing was, I couldn't think of a room or a house or anything to describe the way Stradlater said he wanted to have. I'm not too crazy about describing rooms and houses anyway, so what I did was I wrote about my brother Allie's baseball mitt. So we got a brother DB and a brother Allie. It was a very descriptive subject, it really was. My brother Allie had this left-handed fielder's mitt. He was left-handed. The thing that was descriptive about it, though, was that he had poems written all over the fingers and the pocket and everywhere in green ink. He wrote them on it so that he'd have something to read when he was in the field and nobody was up at bat. He's dead now. He got leukemia and died when we were up in Maine on July 18th, 1946. You'd have liked him. He was two years younger than I was, but he was about 50 times as intelligent. He was terrifically intelligent. His teachers were always writing letters to my mother, telling her what a pleasure it was having a boy like Allie in their class. And they weren't just shooting the crap. They really meant it. But it wasn't just that he got the most intel it wasn't just that he was the most intelligent member of the family, he was also the nicest in lots of ways. He never got mad at anybody. People with red hair are supposed to get mad very easily, but Allie never did. I wonder how far back the gingers Ginger's get mad thing goes. I wonder. I wonder if that's like. I would say. I would say there's a, like a twelve percent chance this is where that shit started, huh? Can you believe this book was like seventy years? I mean, seventy years ago, man. How far back does it go, Ginger's? Holler at your boy. Let me know. People with red hair are supposed to get mad very easily, but Allie never did. And he had very red hair. I'll tell you what kind of red hair he had. I started playing golf when I was only 10 years old. What the fuck does that have to do with red hair? Get to it. You phony. I don't think I've missed any. I hope I haven't. That'd be embarrassing. I bring up the phony counter when I remember it just to miss a couple. I'll tell you what kind of red hair he had. I started playing golf when I was only 12, 10 years old. I remember once, the summer I was around 12, teeing off and all, and having a bunt, having a hunch that if I turned around all of a sudden, I'd see Allie. So I did, and sure enough, he was sitting on his bike outside the fence. 
there was this fence that went all around the course and he was sitting there about 150 yards behind me watching me tee off. That's the kind of red hair he had. Hair, so he's, the hair so red that you just get a feeling he's behind you watching. <laughs> your hair so red you creep me out and I can feel your presence. <laughs> God, he was a nice kid, though. He used to laugh so hard at something he thought of at the dinner table that he just fell off his chair. I was only 13, and they were going to have me psychoanalyzed and all because I broke all the windows in the garage. I don't blame them. I really don't. I slept in the garage the night he died, and I broke all the goddamn windows with my fist just for the hell of it. I even tried to break all the windows on the station wagon we had that summer, but... My hand was already broken and everything by that time, and I just couldn't do it. It was a very stupid thing to do, I'll admit it. So, we notice he's saying, I'll admit, again, right after a stupid thing he did. So I wonder if he thinks admitting, like telling people that, telling whoever's listening or writing the story down that Stradlater's a good-looking guy, and he admits that. I wonder if there's a parallel there. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously, that's what, what he was doing. That's what I said he was doing. He felt guilty about admitting these things or whatever. Like, he was ashamed, but... Stupid. Also. It was a very stupid thing to do, I'll admit, but... I hardly didn't even know what I was doing, and you didn't know Allie. My hand still hurts me once in a while when it rains and all. My nose keeps tickling and I don't have a booger. I keep trying to find it so I can stop, but about every 12 seconds it just tickles. My hand still hurts me once in a while when it rains and all, and I can't make a real fist anymore. Not a tight one, I mean, but outside of that, I don't care much. I mean, I'm not going to be a goddamn surgeon or a violinist or anything anyway. So anyway, that's what I wrote Stradlater's composition about. Old Allie's baseball mitt. I happened to have it with me in my suitcase, so I got it out and copied down the poems that were written on it. All I had to do was change Allie's name so that nobody would know it was my brother and not Stradlater's. I wasn't too crazy about doing it, but I couldn't think of anything else descriptive. Besides, I sort of liked writing about it. It took me about an hour because I had to use Stradlater's lousy typewriter and it kept jamming on me. The reason I didn't use my own was because I'd lent it to a guy down the hall. It was around 10.30, I guess, when I finished it. I wasn't tired, though, so I looked out the window for a while. It wasn't snowing anymore, but every once in a while you could hear a car somewhere not being able to get started. You could also hear old Ackley snoring right through the goddamn shower curtains you could hear him. He had sinus trouble and he couldn't breathe too hot when he was asleep. That guy had just about everything. Sinus trouble, pimples, lousy teeth, halitosis, crummy fingernails. You had to feel a little sorry for that crazy son of a bitch. But we got, we got your boy out here feeling a little bit, um, a little, uh, What's the word I need to look? I can't. There's not a. There's not a word I'm looking for. I just think it's nice he's being a little introspective and, you know, raising his. I'm trying to not to say it in like a weird, spiritual mumbo jumbo type of way, but um, it's interesting to me that after writing, listening, thinking, writing about Ali and introducing us to Ali, that. Now he's kind of feeling a little bit sorry about Ackley, and looking at him in a different light and taking everything in around him and slowing down a little bit. You know, it feels a lot less anxious when he's talking like this. When he's, when he's recollecting these things after these events, he seems a lot less wound up. A lot more willing to share. Before we get there, actually, before we get to chapter six, I just think it's... It's fun to watch Holden's ups and downs, right? Watching in awe of Stradlater, you know, possibly has a crush on him, probably jealous of him, you know, maybe idealizes him a little bit. Then he dumps the 
dumps the bomb on him that he's dating a chick that he's all of a sudden obsessed with again, but he hasn't brought up. I don't know why I highlighted that. That wasn't important. But, um, yeah. And then, um, obsesses about the girl for some time. He takes his jacket. He takes Holden's jacket as just like another total power move, right? Didn't ask, I mean, he asked for it, but never really got permission, took it anyway. Went out with that girl. <clears throat> now he's got to deal with Ackley and Broussard, which Broussard seems like a nice enough guy. Got disappointed there was no movie, and then he's like, fuck that movie. So it's like, <clears throat> all of his loyalties seem all of his loyalties seem half-baked. You know what I'm saying? He doesn't seem like a terribly loyal kind of guy. But we'll see as time goes on. We'll see what's up. Sorry, I'm itching my legs, itching like crazy. I even just crossed my legs so it would be closer to me. Jesus. Eczema. Chapter 6. Some things are hard to remember. I'm thinking now of when Stridelator got back from his date with Jane. I mean... I can't remember exactly what I was doing when I heard his goddamn stupid footsteps coming down the corridor. I was probably still looking out the window, but I swear I can't remember. I was so damn worried, that's why. When I really worry about something, I don't just fool around. I even have to go to the bathroom when I worry about something. Only, I don't go. I'm too worried to go. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt my worrying to go. If you knew Stradlater, you'd have been worried too. I double dated with that bastard a couple times, and I know what I'm talking about. He was unscrupulous. He really was. Holden also likes to lean on that he really was thing a lot, huh? Anyway, the corridor was all linoleum and all, and you could hear his goddamn footsteps coming right towards the room. I don't even remember where I was sitting when he came in. At the window or... In my chair or his, I swear I can't remember. He came in griping about how cold it was out, and then he said, Where the hell is everybody? It's like a goddamn morgue around here. I didn't even bother to answer him. If he was so goddamn stupid not to realize... Oh, shit, I forgot. He was like the New York... The fucking... Hey, yo, guy. Fucking Dice Clay. I forgot. If he was so goddamn stupid not to realize it was Saturday night, and everybody was out or asleep or home for the weekend, I wasn't going to break my neck telling him. He started getting undressed. He didn't say one goddamn word about Jane. Not one. Neither did I. I just watched him. All he did was thank me. All he did was thank me for letting him wear my hound's tooth. He hung it up on a hanger and put it in the closet. Then when he was taking off his tie, he asked me if I had written his goddamn composition for him. I told him it was over on his goddamn bed. He walked over and read it while he was unbuttoning his shirt. He stood there, reading it, and sort of stroking his bare chest and stomach with this very stupid expression on his face. He was always stroking his stomach or chest. He was mad about himself. All of a sudden he said, For Christ's sake, Holden, this was about a goddamn baseball glove. So what? I said, cold as hell. What do you mean, so what? I told you it had to be about a goddamn room or a house or something. You said it had to be descriptive. What the hell's the difference if it's about a baseball glove? God damn it. He was sore as hell. He was really furious. You always do everything back asswards. Look at me. No wonder you're flunking the hell out of here, I said. You don't do one damn thing the way you're supposed to. I mean it. Not one damn thing. All right. Give it back to me then. I went over, pulled it right out of his goddamn hand, and I tore it up. What the hell did you do that for? He said. I didn't even answer him. I just threw the pieces in the wastebasket, and then I lay down on my bed, and we both didn't say anything for a long time. He got all undressed down to his shorts, and I lay on my bed and lit a cigarette. You weren't allowed to smoke in the dorm, but you could do it late at night when everybody was asleep or out and nobody could smell the smoke. Besides, I did it to annoy Stradley. It, would drove, it drove him crazy when he broke any rules. He never smoked in the dorm. It was only me. He still didn't say one single solitary word about Jane, so I finally said, You're back pretty goddamn late if she only signed out for 
Did you make her be late signing in? He was sitting on the edge of his bed, cutting his goddamn toenails when I asked him that. A couple of minutes, he said, who the hell signs out for 9.30 on a Saturday night? God, how I hated him. Did you go to New York? I said, you crazy? How the hell we could go to New York if she only signed out for 9.30? Yeah, that's tough. He looked up at me. Listen, he said, you're gonna smoke in the room. How about going down to the can and do it? You may be getting the hell out of here, but I have to stick around long enough to graduate. I ignored him. I really did. I went right on smoking like a madman. All I did was sort of turn over on my side and watched him cut his damn toenails. What a school. You were always watching somebody cut their goddamn toenails or squeeze their pimples or something. I swear to God he said pimple five times in these last two chapters. Hasn't said phony once. Did you give her my regards? I asked him. Yeah. The hell he did, the bastard. What would she say? Did you ask her if she still keeps all her kings on the back row? No, I didn't ask her. What the hell do you think? We did all night play checkers, for Christ's sake. Didn't even answer him. God, how I hated him. If you didn't go to New York, where'd you go with her? I asked him. I asked him after a little while. I could feel, I could hardly, I, ugh, my, come on, some more, ribbity, ribbity. Ribbity, ribbity. I don't know why I say that. It just feels like the rewind sound. Did I analyze that? Error, error, error. No, that's just beatboxing. Yeah, whatever. Shut up. Leave me alone. If you didn't go to New York, where'd you go with her? I asked him after a little while. I could hardly keep my voice from shaking all over the place. Boy, I was getting nervous. I just had a feeling something had gone funny. When he had finished cutting his goddamn toenails, so he got up from the bed. Oh, he was finished cutting his goddamn toenails. So he got up from the bed in just his damn shorts and all and started getting very damn playful. He came over to my bed and started leaning over me, taking these playful as hell so socks at my shoulder. Cut it out, I said. Where'd you go with her if you didn't go to New York? Nowhere. We just sat in the goddamn car. He gave me another one of those playful little stupid socks on the shoulder. Cut it out, I said. Whose car? Ed Banky's. Ed Banky was the basketball coach at Pensy. Old Stradlater was one of his pets because he was the center on the team. And Ed Banky always let him borrow his car when he wanted. It wasn't allowed for students to borrow faculty guys' cars, but all the athletic bastards stuck together. In every school I've gone to, all the athletic bastards stick together. Stradlater kept taking these shadow punches down at my shoulder. He had his toothbrush in his hand, and he put it in his mouth. What'd you do? Give her the time and Ed Banks his goddamn car? My voice was shaking something awful. What a thing to say. You want me to wash your mouth out with soap? Did you? That's a professional secret, buddy. This next part, I don't remember so hot. All I know is I got up from the bed like I was going down to the can or something, and then I tried to sock him with all my might, right smack in the toothbrush, till it would split his goddamn throat open. Only I missed. I didn't connect. All I did was sort of get him on the side of the head or something. Probably hurt him a little bit, but not as much as I wanted. It probably would have hurt him a lot, but I did it with my right hand, and I just can't make a good fist with that hand on account of that injury I told you about. That's called a callback. Let's go. Fucking, fucking, this dude's a cut. This dude's a, the best writer on the planet. See? He's all intentional. Told you, dude. Anyway. Anyway, the next thing I knew, I was on the goddamn floor, and he was sitting on my chest with his face all red. That is, he had his goddamn knees on my chest, and he weighed about a ton. He had hold of my wrists, too, but I couldn't take another sock at him. I'd have killed him. Damn, we got the rare double contraction here. I'd have, I'd have killed him. Look at that. What the hell's the matter with you? He kept saying, and his stupid face kept getting redder and redder. Get your lousy knees off my chest. 
I told him. I was almost bawling. I really was. Go on, get off me, you crummy bastard. He wouldn't do it though. He kept holding onto my wrists and I kept calling him a son of a bitch and all for around 10 hours. I can hardly even remember what all I said to him. I told him he thought he could give the time to anybody he felt like. I told him he didn't even care if a girl kept all her kings on the back row or not. And the reason he didn't care was because he was a goddamn stupid moron. He hated it when you called him a moron. All morons hate it when you call them a moron. Shut up now, Holden. Just shut up now. You don't even know if your first name is Jane or Jean, you goddamn moron. Now shut up, Holden. God damn it, I'm warning you. He said, I really had him going. If you don't shut up, I'm gonna slam you one. Get your dirty, stinking moron knees off my chest. If I let you up, would you keep your mouth shut? I didn't even answer him. He said it over again. Holden, if I let you up, will you keep your mouth shut? Yes. He got up off me and I got up too. My chest hurt like hell from his dirty knees. You're a dirty, stupid son of a bitch of a moron, I told him. That got him really mad. He shook his big stupid finger in my face. Holden, goddammit, I'm warning you now for the last time. If you don't keep your yap shut, I'm gonna... Why should I? I said. I was practically yelling. That's just the trouble with all you morons. You never want to discuss anything. That's the way you can always tell a moron. They never want to discuss anything intelligent. Then he really let one go at me. And the next thing I knew, I was on the goddamn floor again. I don't remember if he knocked me out or not, but I don't think so. Pretty hard to knock a guy out except in the goddamn movies. But my nose was bleeding all over the place. When I looked up, old Stridelator was standing practically right on top of me. He had his goddamn toilet kit under his arm. Why the hell don't you shut up when I tell you to? He said. He sounded pretty nervous. He probably was scared he fractured my skull or something when I hit the floor. It's too bad I didn't. You asked for it, goddammit. He said, boy did he look worried. I didn't even bother to get up. I just lay there on the floor for a while and kept calling him a moron son of a bitch. I was so mad, I was practically bawling. Listen, go wash your face, you hear me? I told him to go wash his own moron face, which was a pretty childish thing to say, but I was mad as hell. I told him to stop off on the way to the can and give Mrs. Schmidt the time. Mrs. Schmidt was the janitor's wife. She was around 65. So giving somebody the time is fucking. That's what that's what that means. If y'all didn't catch that one, I'm just letting y'all know. So if you're gonna go fuck that, go if you're gonna fuck Jane, why don't you go fuck the 65 year old janitor's wife, you bitch? You know what I should do? You know what sounds like a little bit of fun? I want to retell the story of Catcher on the Rye in the modern day. Be like TBH Bay and shit or whatever. I don't know. Shut up. I kept sitting there on the floor till I heard old Stradlater close the door and go down the corridor to the can. And then I got up. I couldn't find my goddamn hunting hat anywhere. Finally, I found it and it was under the bed. I put it on and turned the old peak around to the back the way I liked it. And then I went over, took a look at my stupid face in the mirror. You never saw such a gore in your life. I had blood all over my mouth and chin and even on my pajamas and bathrobe. It partly scared me and partly fascinated me. All that blood and all that blood and all sort of made me look tough. I'd only been in about two fights in my life and I lost both of them. I'm not too tough. I'm a pacifist if you want to know the truth. I had a feeling old Ackley probably heard all the racket and was awake. So I went through the shower curtains into his room just to see what the hell he was doing. I hardly ever went over to his room. It always had a funny stink in it because he was so crummy in his personal habits. Well, I thought we were getting pretty close to the end, but it looks like we still got about another 20 or so minutes, but we're right at an hour. Do we want to try and fit in a whole nother chapter? 
A lot of dialogue, we could probably get through it pretty quick. Ooh, there's a lot of paragraphs. Let's try it. Let's try to, let's try to stretch it to an hour 20, huh? Chapter 7. I can't believe he fought Strad later, bro. What the fuck? I was so excited about keep, keeping going that we didn't even talk about it. I can't believe he fought Strad later, bro. I don't know if I don't know if I expected that or not, but I did notice that he started saying how much he hated the bastard and stuff. And now, uh, where would he say it? It's it's hard finding it, the specific stuff, but he said he hated him, and he guessed it right away. I'm not sure. I don't know, man. What y'all think? Y'all think Stradlater fucked her or not? I'm not sure if he did or not. Knees on the chest is wild. Socked him one, bloodied his ass up, but then my favorite thing, he laid down and... Oh, I thought he was going to clean his ass up when he, he said he had his toilet pack. And he was just nervous. Yeah, so he didn't clean him up. I thought he was going to. Yeah, he just left. Never mind. But I thought Stradlater, Stradlater was actually kind of a good guy, but I was wrong. I thought he helped him clean him up, so I'm glad I didn't say that. I didn't say that. You didn't hear me. Chapter 7, 7, 7, 7. I wonder if I should do that shit, that title shit with the echoes and stuff. I don't know. Maybe we'll try it out. We'll try it out. A tiny bit of light came through the shower curtains and all from our room, and I could see him lying in bed. I knew damn well he was wide awake. Ackley, I said. You awake? Yeah. It was pretty dark, and I stepped on somebody's shoe on the floor, and damn near fell on my head. Ackley sort of sat up in bed and leaned on his arm. He had a lot of white stuff on his face, for his pimples. He sort of looked spooky in the dark. What the fuck was that? Did y'all see that big ass bug? Am I tripping? Hello? Am I still alive? Charlie, come kill this bug, dude. My cat's lazy as hell. I ain't killing no bugs. He looks sort of spooky in the dark. It is weird that that happened when I said spooky too, huh? He looks sort of spooky in the dark. What the hell are you doing anyway? I said. What do you mean, what the hell am I doing? I was trying to sleep before you guys started making all that noise. What the hell is the fight about anyhow? Where's the light? I couldn't find the light. I was sliding my hand all over the wall. What do you want the light for? Right next to your hand. I finally found the switch and turned it on. Oh, Ackley put his hand up so the light wouldn't hurt his eyes. Jesus, what the hell happened to you? He meant all the blood and all. I had a little goddamn tiff with Stradley. I said. And then I sat down on the floor. They never had any chairs in their room. I don't know what the hell they did with their chairs. Listen, I said. Do you feel like playing a little canasta? He was a canasta fiend. You're still bleeding for Christ's sake. You better put something on it. It'll stop. Listen, you wanna, you wanna play a little canasta or don't you? Canasta, for Christ's sake. You know what time it is by any chance? It isn't late. Only around 11, 11.30? Only around, Ackley said. Listen. I gotta get up and go to mass in the morning, for Christ's sake. You guys start hollering and fighting in the middle of the goddamn... What was that fight about, anyhow? It's a long story. I don't want to bore you, Ackley. I'm thinking of your welfare. I never discussed my personal life with him. In the first place, he was even more stupid than Stradlater. Stradlater was a goddamn genius next to Ackley. Hey, I said, is it okay if I sleep in Eli's bed tonight? He won't be back until tomorrow night, will he? I knew damn well he wouldn't. Eli went home damn near every weekend. I don't know when the hell he's coming back, Ackley said. Boy, did that annoy me. That boy gets annoyed a lot. What the hell do you mean you don't know when he's coming back? He never comes back till Sunday night, does he? No, but for Christ's sake, I can't just tell somebody they can sleep in his goddamn bed if they want to. That killed me. I'm sorry, I was thinking about discussing the fact that I'm thinking that Holden's acting like a six-year-old that pissed the bed, right? 
kind of did metaphorically. That killed me. I reached up from where I was sitting on the floor and patted him on the goddamn shoulder. You're a prince, Ackley kid. You know that? No, I mean it. I can't just tell somebody they can sleep and you're a real prince. You're a gentleman and a scholar, kid. I wonder if that's where that phrase came from. He's a gentleman and a scholar. He really was, too. Do you happen to have any cigarettes by chance? Say no or I'll drop dead. No, I don't, as a matter of fact. Listen, what the hell was the fight about? I didn't answer him. All I did was got up, went over, looked out the window. Felt so lonesome all of a sudden. Oh, I thought that was a comma. All I did was I got up, went over, and looked out the window. I felt so lonesome all of a sudden. I almost wished I was dead. What the hell was the fight about anyhow? Ackley said for about the 50th time. He certainly was a bore about that. About you. About me, for Christ's sake. Yeah, I was defending your goddamn honor. Stradlater said you had a lousy personality and I couldn't let him get away with that stuff. That got him excited. He did? No kidding. He did? I told him I was only kidding and then I went over and laid down on Eli's bed. Boy, did I feel rotten. I felt so damn lonesome. This room stinks, I said. I can smell your socks from way over here. Don't you ever send them to the laundry? If you don't like it, you know what you can do, Ackley said. What a witty guy. How about turning off the goddamn light? I didn't turn it off right away, though. I just kept laying there on Eli's bed, thinking about Jane and all. It just drove me stark staring mad when I thought about her. When I thought about her and Stradlater parked somewhere in that fat-ass Ed Banksy's car. Banky. Every time I thought about it, I felt like jumping out the window. The thing is, you didn't know Stradlater. I knew him. Most guys at Pensy just talked about having sexual intercourse with girls all the time, like Ackley, for instance, but old Stradlater really did it. I was personally acquainted with at least two girls he gave the time to, and that's the truth. Tell me the fascinating story of your life, Ackley kid. How about turning off the goddamn light? I gotta get up for mass in the morning. I got up and turned it off. If it made him happy, then I laid down on Eli's bed again. What are you gonna do? Sleep in the Eli's sleep in Eli's bed? Ackley said he was the perfect host. Boy. I may. I may not. Don't worry about it. I'm not worried about it. Only I'd hate like hell if Eli came in all of a sudden and found some guy. Relax, I'm not gonna sleep here. I wouldn't abuse your goddamn hospitality. A couple of minutes later. He was snoring like mad. I kept laying there in the dark anyway, trying not to think about old Jane and Stradlater and that goddamn Ed Banky's car, but it was almost impossible. The trouble was, I knew that guy Stradlater's technique. That made it even worse. We once double dated in Ed Banky's car, and Stradlater was in the back with his date, and I was in the front with mine. What a technique that guy had. What he'd do was... He'd start snowing his date in this very quiet snowing. What a technique that guy had. What he'd do is, he'd start snowing his date in this very quiet, sincere voice. Like, as if he wasn't only a very handsome guy, but a nice and sincere guy too. I damn near puked to listen to him. His date kept saying, no, please. Please don't. Please. Oh, I thought he was being polite. His date kept saying, no, please don't. Please. I'm not sure what the intention is there. But old Stradlater kept snowing her in this Abraham Lincoln sincere voice, and finally there'd be this terrific silence in the back of the car. It was really embarrassing. I don't think he gave that girl the time that night, but damn near. Damn near. While I was laying there trying not to think, I heard old Stradlater come back from the can and go into our room. You could hear him putting away his crumbly toilet articles and all, and opening the window. He was a fresh air fiend. That, that lies back. You could hear him putting away his crummy, crummy toilet articles and all, and opening the window. He was a fresh air fiend. 
Then, a little while later, he turned off the light. He didn't even look around to see where I was at. It was even depressing out in the street. You couldn't even hear any cars anymore. I got the feeling, I got feeling so lonesome and rotten, I even felt like waking Ackley up. Hey, Ackley, I said in sort of a whisper, so Stradlater couldn't hear me through the shower curtain. Ackley didn't hear me though. Hey, Ackley, he still didn't hear me, he slept like a rock. Hey, Ackley, you heard that all right. Hey, Ackley, sorry man, you heard that all right. What the hell's the matter with you, he said, and I was asleep for Christ's sake. Listen, what's the routine on joining a monastery? I asked him. I was sort of toying with the idea of joining one. Do you have to be a Catholic and all? Certainly you have to be a Catholic, you bastard. Did you just wake me up to ask me a dumb qu- ah, Go back to sleep. I'm not going to join one anyway, the kind of luck I'd have. I'd probably join one with all the wrong kinds of monks in it. All stupid bastards. Or just bastards. God, this kid's insufferable, man. <laughs> when I said that, old Ackley sat wat the, <laughs> sat wat, sat wat the, when I said that, old Ackley sat way the hell up in bed. Listen, he said, I don't care what you say about me or anything, but if you start making cracks about my goddamn religion for Christ's sake, relax, I said, nobody's making any cracks about your goddamn religion. I got up off Eli's bed and started towards the door. I didn't want to hang around in that stupid atmosphere anymore. I stopped on the way though and picked up Ackley's hand and gave him a big phony handshake. Hey! Gave him a big phony handshake. He pulled it away from me. What's the idea? He said. No idea. I just want to thank you for being such a goddamn prince, that's all. I said it in this very sincere voice. You're aces, Ackley kid. You know that? wise guy. Somebody, someday somebody's gonna bash. I didn't even bother to listen to him. I shut the damn door and went out in the corridor. Everybody was asleep or out or home for the week and it was very, very quiet and depressing in the corridor. There was this empty box of Colyano's toothpaste outside Leahy and Hoffman's door and while I walked down the stairs I kept giving it a boot with this sheep-lined slipper I had on. What I thought I'd do... I thought I might go down and see what Maul Brassard was doing. But all of a sudden, I changed my mind. All of a sudden, I decided what I'd really do. I'd get the hell out of Pensy. Right that same night and all. I mean, not wait until Wednesday or anything. I just didn't want to hang around anymore. It made me too sad and lonesome. So what I decided I'd do? I decided I'd take a room in a hotel in New York. A very inexpensive hotel and all, and just take it easy till Wednesday. Then on Wednesday, I'd go home all rested up and feeling swell. I figured my parents probably wouldn't get old Thurmer's letter saying I'd been given the axe till maybe Tuesday or Wednesday. I didn't want to go home or anything till they got it, thoroughly digested it and all, and I didn't want to be around when they first got it. My mother gets very hysterical. She's not too bad after she gets something thoroughly digested, though. Besides, I sort of needed a little vacation. My nerves were shot, they really were. Anyway, that's what I decided I'd do. So I went back to the room and turned on the light, start packing and all. I already had quite a few things packed. Old Stradlater didn't even wake up. I lit a cigarette and got all dressed, and I packed these two Gladstones I have. It only took me about two minutes. I'm a very rapid packer. One thing about packing depressed me a little. I had to pack these brand new ice skates my mother had practically just sent me a couple days before. That depressed me. I could see my mother going in Spaldings and asking the salesman a million dopey questions and here I was getting the ax again. It made me feel pretty sad. She bought me the wrong kind of skates. I wanted racing skates and she bought hockey, but it made me sad anyway. Almost any time somebody gives me a present, it ends up making me sad. After I got all packed, I sort of counted my dough. I don't remember exactly how much I had, but I was pretty loaded. My grandmother sent me a, ba a, sent me a wad about a week before. I have this grandmother that's quite lavish with her dough. She doesn't 
have all her marbles anymore. She's old as hell. And she keeps sending me money for my birthday about four times a year. Anyway, even though I was pretty loaded, I figured I could always use a few extra bucks. You never know, so... So what I did was I went down the hall and woke up Frederick Woodruff, this guy I'd lent my typewriter to. I asked him how much he'd give me for it. He was a pretty wealthy guy. He said he didn't know. He said he didn't much want to buy it. Finally, he bought it, though. It cost about 90 bucks, and all he bought it for was 20. He was sore because I'd woke him up. When I was all set to go, when I had my bags and all, I stood for a while next to the stairs and took a last look down the goddamn corridor. I was sort of crying. I don't know why. I put my red hunting hat on and turned the peak around to the back the way I liked it. And then I yelled at the top of my goddamn voice. Sleep tight, you morons! I'll bet I woke up every bastard on the whole floor. Then I got the hell out. Some stupid guy had thrown peanut shells all over the stairs and I damn near broke my crazy neck. What an interesting... What an interesting boy we've got here, huh? Instead of dealing with the consequences of the fight and talking with Strad later about the incident, he just decides he's going to leave early and get a vacation, uh, get a vacation, get a hotel room and take a little vacation. <clears throat> Interesting that he took refuse. What's the word I'm looking for, y'all? Fuck. Whatever. In another dude's bed, and especially in Ackley's room where it stinks. Like, smoking in the dorm room. This kid's so destructive, bro. He's so self-destructive. This, this Jane chick's really done him in. I know she's gonna wind up coming back. She has to, right? <laughs> Very fun stuff, man. Very good stuff. I like this paragraph here. I was trying to find it. I like this paragraph about the um, about the skates. Nice little, you know. I, what I, what I'm getting at is, you can tell he's not a complete psychopath, right? Like he definitely feels emotions. Like he's just a kind of misled and angsty fucking teenager that doesn't know quite how to handle himself. Especially if he's. If he's trying really hard to get laid and can't, that's really like a, a strange phenomenon for a young man. Because all of a sudden he get, he starts getting obsessed about this chick out of nowhere, man. Poor Jane, too. Because I have a feeling that when he fucking does start talking to her, man, gosh, she's going to be overwhelmed. Poor Holden, man. Poor Holden. But I love you guys. I'm really, really just blown away by the fact that we still got so many people listening um <clears throat> this book's a lot of fun to read i'm liking i'm liking the flow a lot compared to the other book that we read in season one the soundtrack is amazing <clears throat> and i'm having a great time and i wouldn't like to spend this great time with anybody but y'all so i decided that i'm gonna pay you you already heard about it at the top but i'm gonna tell you again Hop in the Discord. We got it up there above the phony counter. You could type that that in to your web browsers and be invited to my Discord channel. Uh, you'll find the questions in the Castio Vote channel in Discord, or you can find them if you just start scrolling down. I'll probably pin them to the top of the Facebook page or something. You know, make them the, a featured post or something like that. Those should be easy to find. I don't know. I'll make a graphic for them too. But we got a long way for the season to go, so I'll make sure all this all the questions continue to get uh, updated and added and everything so it's gonna be three questions per episode so but yeah appreciate y'all for stopping by again check your shelf baby baby we out this biatch